Wouldn't life be simpler if we built products that everyone could use and designed buildings that anyone could easily access? Well, tonight on HYS Weekly, you are going to meet a woman who, for three years, disguised herself as an elderly woman to find out how she would be treated. 116 cities later, Patricia Moore is a believer in design with everyone in mind. You have to hear her amazing story and find out more about what she calls universal design. It's all coming up next on HYS Weekly. sad fact of life, but discrimination is everywhere, and Patricia Moore's passion is to help erase some of the separatism involving older persons and people with physical handicaps. America is like that. It's a place where often old age and people with physical disabilities are, well, they're, they're treated in, in a less than reverent way. Conventional wisdom would say, well, put up signs that say handicap, this ramp for you and this door for you. But Patricia Moore says there's a better way, and you call it universal design. Mm -hmm. And that's the name of your company. And I think we have to, I think we have to back up a little bit, because I, I just said to you, before, before I, I read about you, before I met you, I must say that what you are working so passionately to achieve had never occurred to me. It, I just thought that we had to have handicap exits and we had to have certain ramps and we had to have this separatism and we don't, do we? Not at all. In fact, it's more expensive. Why do we keep approaching it that we have to have two solutions when one would do? Unfortunately, we never thought about that um, until we had more people with greater need. And it was the Vietnam War, interestingly, that gave us some of our biggest challenge. Those young men, my fellows, the baby boomers who fought in Vietnam, who came home in wheelchairs, who came home without legs, said, I want a job. Their dads and their uncles and their grandfathers from Korea and the World Wars were accepting of the fact that you stayed at home and that someone took care of you. There's an independence in the spirit, starting with the baby boomer, that doesn't allow for this, this need for someone else to do it for you. We have a passion to do it for ourselves. And that's led to a dramatic change in attitude in our culture. Also in this country, Patricia, there's an often lurid picture drawn of, of elderly people. Now you are a young woman. You are in your early 40s now. But 10 years ago, when you were even a much younger woman, you took on an experiment that, well, I remember reading about it, and maybe some of my viewers do. The book was uh, entitled Disguised. Patricia, you put on a costume, and you dressed as a, you know what it's like to be an old lady, don't you? You're, you've already been there and back. You dressed as a woman in her early 80s, and you traveled to 116 cities. Now, share your story. Well, it's incredible to think it was even that long ago. I was 25 at the time. I'm 45 in October. And what I realized I had to do was to communicate more clearly what it felt like to be an elder. As a woman of 25, when I would speak of the needs of my elders, whether they be my grandparents or a woman who was 50, people looked at me like, why do you care? Mm -hmm. You know, those aren't very well, what important do you know? people. Yeah. And even in research, in speaking with older people, they would encourage me that they were fine. No problems. Don't worry about me, dear. Everything's okay. And I realized a lot of that feedback came from a fear, perhaps, that they would be displaced, that if they said just how troubling their daily life would be, that they might end up in skilled care, that their home was the most important thing to them, that they didn't want to leave their nest. So they weren't about to be forthcoming mm -hmm. in terms of the daily difficulties they faced. And it was then that I realized if I could become an elder, if I could live and look like an elder, 
then I would have a voice that would give me the distinction of being able to say, I really understand. So from 1979 to 1982, you, you disguised yourself mm -hmm. as an 80-year-old woman. Uh, you didn't do this in just a casual way. Uh, the costume took, what, two to four hours yes. to put on yeah. each day? Uh, describe it. I wish we, had, I wish we were able to, to show some, some, some visual uh, you know, uh, examples of, of what you looked like, but I have, I have a pretty good picture. You put leg splints on so that you couldn't, your knees would, would be immobile. Mm -hmm. My entire body was encased in different prosthetics. So my vision was declined with an opaque contact lens. My hearing was blocked uh, by plugging my ears and using non-operating hearing aids. I wore bandages um, on my knees, on my hips, uh, a full torso brace. Uh, my fingers were wrapped. I always wore gloves. So I couldn't do the simplest of tasks that I required uh, in terms of daily independence. Um, but it was very much the creation of a shell that so many older people tell us. They feel that they could just break out of this, this outer skin inside. They're a well person. They're a person able. And that's, uh, that was perhaps the most startling thing about this whole transformation. I have a little nephew who says I was the first Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> uh, but there was no humor in your Mrs. No, Doubtfire. No, none whatsoever. You learned how to fall without injuring yourself. Yeah, I got really good at just relaxing. You could feel it coming and you would just say, uh oh, and boom, there you would be. Okay, you had any personal attacks? I was mugged on two occasions. The first one was really quite harmful harmless in terms of not being injured. Um, I was thrown down a flight of stairs. I was hit over the head. And between my hat and the wig, um, I wasn't injured, really, and I tumbled nicely. And when I realized my purse was gone, I have to admit it was very thrilling because I recognized I had passed whoever this nitwit was. Mm -hmm. He stole a little old lady's purse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but she was 25. So he had the handbag of somebody uh, that he had decided was a victim because they couldn't fight him off. Patricia, older people are often treated with disrespect, mm -hmm. but they are treated many times even worse than that. They're, they're almost invisible. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that? Yeah, I really felt that people either were looking through me or I had become inanimate. People would bump into you on city streets as if they had just brushed against a building or a bush or a garbage pail, worse yet. And when they caused me to lose my footing, and when, in fact, I would fall, they kept walking as if nothing had happened. And oftentimes, it was another older person who came to my aid. What was the worst thing that happened to you? Probably the mugging. Mm -hmm. I was beaten by a gang of um, uh, probably eight boys. That's what I've seen in, in uh, hypnosis. Um, but they were no more than 10 or 12 years of age, really babies. And they beat me, um, left me in a pool of my own blood. Patricia. You visited 116 cities. Mm -hmm. One of them was Pittsburgh. You spent mm -hmm. 10 days here. Mm -hmm. Was this a tough city? In the winter, <laughs> but well, it was just hideous. Right. And I had a miserable time with public transport. It was very, very difficult to get around. Um, I was often uh, misdirected as to which bus to take. Um, I found myself uh, struggling to get seating. I found gruffness amongst the drivers and other passengers. I would deliberately travel at rush hour so that when it would take me longer to climb the steps, you would hear from the other passengers who were in a hurry to get to work, and I was obviously slowing them down. Typically, the bus driver would start off before I was seated, and again, I would fall. You've been at this a long time. Mm -hmm. That's many years ago, and, and, and I know you're fighting hard, you're passionate in, in your crusade, but there obviously is a lot of resistance because we're not seeing the changes coming fast enough. Not at all. We're, we're really acting as if we're going to cure this nasty old thing. And the baby boomer, my generation, is, is really at fault for this. I, I refer to us as the nip it, tuck it, liposuck it generation. <laughs> you know, we'll spray on our mm -hmm. minoxidil and we'll lather mm -hmm. on the retin-A and we just know we're going to get it fixed and so we really don't have to be prepared for it. And we can ignore it and deny it and be afraid of it more than anything else. Mm -hmm. The United States, as a society, as a social culture, is terrified of growing older and trains itself to be discriminatory and biased in terms of age. Uh, women in particular are told after a certain age, we're really no longer desirable 
and yet Sean Connery gets cuter every year. Exactly. It doesn't seem fair, Men does and it? women age differently. Yeah. A man of 50 has just hit his stride. Mm -hmm. He's on top of his game. Mm -hmm. A woman of 50 is perceived often as menopausal. She's, uh, there, if, if she's a professional, there's some kind of insidious little uh, gremlin at work trying to find some younger person mm -hmm. to replace her. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the older men in this country are treated with the same kind of disrespect that you found as an older woman? Professional older men do much better. Older men that are in the trades find that, especially if they lose their job and are retired early, forcibly, are at as much risk as women overall. When this uh, work was replicated by uh, men, they found themselves to be more fearful of being viewed as someone who wasn't earning an income someone who wasn't you know, carrying their share. Um, particularly when I did the bag lady, we found that men doing homeless people were despised far more than I was mm -hmm. as a homeless woman. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I was cared for more charitably than men. Men were considered to be losers, someone who had messed up their life, probably an abuser of some sort, and therefore it was their fault they were on the street. Women were viewed with a little more charity that something about circumstance, widowhood perhaps, mm -hmm. had caused us to become homeless. Patricia, you must have had some, some nice experiences. There, there must have been someone who tried to help you across the street. Who, who offered the, the most help? And, and can you pick out any, any city that was gentler than another? Um, were there young people that offered you help or, or other older people? Well, there were really no correlations to size of city, north, south, east, west, time of day. We kept searching for something where we could point to and say this mm -hmm. is what would make it better. We found little children who were very forthcoming and kind. And we also found little children who were terrified by my presence. There's a great deal of research that supports the fact that children who are not exposed to grandparents or grandparent figures mm -hmm. are getting their attitude about elders from the literature, Grimm's Fairy Tales. Mm -hmm. They see us as you know, wicked witches about to throw them into the oven. Mm -hmm. So they were often very frightened of me. So really, uh, elders caring for other elders, people of all ages, it's mostly people who are aware of someone else's needs who have a tendency to stop and share their day. So I guess our viewers better learn to listen from this, better watch out that little old lady crossing the street, maybe some 25-year-old in disguise. When we come back, we want you to find out how Patricia managed to shock ad agency executives when she tested their latest product. Now that's coming up next on AgeWise Weekly and you don't want to miss this story. night gathered into gear with two high performance automobile experts at nine join john davis for the inside track on the latest automotive news and information on motor week and at 9 30 have fun with lucille treganow who can help you with everything you need to know from under the hood on lucille's car care clinic fine tune your evening with motor week at nine and lucille's car care clinic at 9 30 thursday night on wqen 16. Britain's Finest wants you for a good time. I beg your pardon? Just stay fit. Exercise, fresh air, plenty of roughage. And take your job seriously. Who knows what danger lurks in the fearsome watches of the night? It is our mission to seek it out. Boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> Join the ranks of fun with Rowan Atkinson and walk the thin blue line. Thursday night at 11 and 11.30 on WQEX 16. Well, Patricia Moore is my guest tonight, and I want to tell you, she will go to any length to prove her point. I guess you've often wondered how products are designed and then how they are marketed. Well, there are advertising agencies in New York City, a lot of them on Madison Avenue, and they're up on the high floors, and a lot of people sit around big, shiny mahogany tables. And Well, Patricia, I'm going to let you pick up the story here because you were in one of those boardrooms one day, 
as plans were discussed, a marketing plan for a product, and it was an adult diaper. Right. All right. And that's, that's really where the argument began. Um, I couldn't abide going to market calling it an adult diaper. And then the, the argument continued where the executives were talking in terms of, all right, well, we'll call it um, adult incontinence products. And I said, well, the adults who have these issues, who are dealing with this daily, know that they're incontinent. The product should be about giving them continence. And slowly but surely, you could see people coming along and realizing that, yes, you could be proactive and positive. And really, it's, it's for women quite easy. It's more like a menstrual care uh, regimen. Mm -hmm. For men who've never had to use products like that, this is a great shocker in late life. They were considering calling them adult diapers. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And you still see it in popular television. You see people making jokes and mm -hmm. comedians talking mm -hmm. about adult diapers. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're really quite different and they have a much different purpose. Mm -hmm. I also knew that in order to get a marketing plan that made sense, that I'd have to really understand what this was all about. So as the day went on, someone said, well, have we gotten any test results? Do we know if these darn things work? work and right. I stood up and looked behind me and said, well, they seem to. <laughs> and then you saw the looks of around the table as everyone realized that I was wearing it. and. Worse yet, I and had used Patricia it. And Patricia had been drinking coffee all day long, <laughs> sitting in the boardroom with her um, product. product, and it did work. It passed it the test. Yep. Okay. But and after I, that, the agency required that all the executives had to test. I was very popular. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, we, no, we never give brand names on this show, but I think it was something like you can depend on the adult diaper. Uh, you had some other experiences yeah. uh, with the test design of, uh, tell us the story about the mammography unit. Well, we had the opportunity, we being um, the, the various engineers and, and designers at my firm at that time in New York City, we were the first women who had been invited to develop a mammographic unit. And we were working uh, with Wendy Logan in Rochester, mm -hmm. uh, who is a radiologist of great renown, someone who had come up with um, a way to have much less x-ray for the exam. And what she wanted was a special machine as well. So we started to look at some of the features women were asking for. And the big one is less pain, mm -hmm. because we won't lie to anyone if they've not yet had their mammogram. And they should. If they are 40 or 45, they should get a base, baseline mammogram. Um, when your breast is compressed to no, long, to no more than a half inch thickness, mm -hmm. that hurts. Mm -hmm. And especially for a big breasted woman, this mm -hmm. is a painful test. And so you have to uh, be aware that there's some discomfort. I knew by design we could take that away if we had a spring-loaded release that as soon as the x-ray was completed that our breast would be freed. The engineers uh, said, well, that's going to cost too much money. We uh, really the don't. engineers were, were male, male yeah. or female? Mm -hmm. Male. And that was going to cost too much money. Mm -hmm. So we basically would, invited them to... Would you to, have considered uh, asking them to use one of their body parts to test? <laughs> a specific test one, yeah. The, 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 we got the money. Equipment. You got the money. <laughs> It seems to me that, that um, it's a simple matter maybe of, of just observing people yeah. in their homes, in their life, in their kitchen in particular. Mm -hmm. You tell a story about when you were 18 and you watched your grandmother attempt to open the refrigerator door and she had arthritis. Yes. And it was the last meal she prepared. She was in such pain. She shrieked as she pulled away from the refrigerator door. All she had tried to do was grasp that handle and pull open the door and it was too much for her. And that was the last time she cooked. Patricia, why not make things easier for everyone? I know they have, uh, we've, we've shown them on, on this program for people with arthritis, mm -hmm. some of these, uh, these kitchen uh, uh, tools with, with big handles. Why not for everybody? Exactly. Why not have, why not just have universal design? It sounds like a good title, doesn't it, for a company maybe? Well, and it's exactly what we've tried to do, just to bring to the table the sensibility that all of us, regardless of age or ability, have certain things we want to do each and every day. Mm -hmm. And we need the products and the places and the attitude of people to support those needs. And that's universal design. All right. And you have a company. You are the president of a company in Phoenix. What kind of work is going on there? We do everything um, from product design to working on packaging for pill bottles. Um, very happily, we were part of the team that created the kitchen gadgets with the great big grips. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, w one of our biggest areas of activity right now is creating rehabilitation centers. Uh, one of the most exciting aspects in healthcare for us as we age is physical therapy that allows 
allows us to stay as well as possible. It used to be that we assumed grandma would simply stop walking at a certain age. Mm -hmm. We now know that that's unnecessary. So with uh, dedicated physical rehabilitation in our home and in special acute and subacute centers, we create these villages where everyone can practice their activities of daily living, and the nurses and the doctors and the therapists can help us keep the skills we need, especially if we've suffered a stroke or hip surgery, get back the skills we need for daily living. And that, uh, that takes a lot of my time. You want to get rid of the labels. You want to get yeah. rid of the signage. You see no reason to have a handicap sign on a ramp entering a building. I think rather than that, we should tell people what's not accessible. Mm -hmm. The signage should occur when, in fact, not everybody can use it. There shouldn't need to be uh, an axiom that says, OK, this is for you gimps and geezers, and this is for everybody else. And literally, that's what we do by labeling thing f uh, things for the disabled or the handicapped. This is not embracing all people as equal. This is causing separatism. And I find that kind of ageist and ability uh, biased attitude as hateful as uh, gender bias or racial religious bias. Patricia, you've spent your entire career trying to bring about these changes. What can we as consumers do? Be vocal. I need your help. I can't go into a company and say, this is a bad package. Someone with arthritis can't open it. Someone with low vision can't read the instructions. Someone who has had a stroke isn't strong enough to work with this package, this product. I need consumers to also make sure that they're calling the 800 number, that they're writing letters, that they're mm -hmm. sharing their experiences, because collectively. Or just not buying the product. Or not buying the product. Collectively, our voices will make a change. You learned a lot from, from the experience mm -hmm. of, of disguising yourself and, and, and being an, an older person. What is the greatest lesson that you took away from, from that experience? Not to be afraid. I think all of us have been taught to fear tomorrow mm -hmm. and that we should view daily life as a great gift and be happy about change and embrace change and consider it normal and just recognize where ever-changing works of art. You are uh, a visiting professor in, mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh this semester at Carnegie Mellon University. What's, what's some of the work that's going on there that maybe you can share with us? Well, I'm working with the students uh, to make sure that they walk out with an attitude that sees all consumers as equal and sees the opportunities to make solutions that make sense, mm -hmm. cost-effective um, solutions that aid and abet quality of life. Uh, we're doing everything from packaging design to home design uh, to product design. And I think more than anything else, maybe we're adjusting some attitude and some spirit about design. What have you found out about design that, that is focuses only on, on the disabled or on the elderly? Is that the answer? Well, typically it's not, but in some circumstances, for example, if someone's a quadriplegic, mm -hmm. like Chris Reeve, he's going to need very, very specific solutions. Um, we're not going to be able to create cutlery that he can necessarily use in his hand, mm -hmm. but maybe we can create cutlery that attaches to some sort of uh, neck brace or necklace or eyewear or headgear. So there's always a solution waiting to be had. You must first start with an appropriate attitude. Where can people find out more about Universal Design? Well, they can um, call the um, Carnegie Mellon Library. We can help them at the design department. Um, they can call the National Council on Aging in Washington. And also AARP is very actively involved. Patricia, you are a baby boomer. Mm -hmm. uh, 79 million of you are beginning to pass the, the uh, half century mark. Do you think everything might change uh, a little more rapidly as a result of, of you baby boomers who have made a lot of noise as you've marched through life? I call us the nip it, tuck it, liposucket generation. I mm -hmm. don't think that we're going to age gracefully. Um, again, I think we're still looking for a cure. What we're finding as the leading edge, inclusive of the president at age 50, um, they are not necessarily preparing for changes in terms of the lifespan. They are assuming that products and services will be there for them. Uh, this is a terrible legacy for the generation in their 20s because there are so few of them to have to take care of all of our needs individually, monetarily, will be impossible. So industry and government has to wake up and quickly to recognize their responsibility to making all people able by design. 
Well, the uh, company, your company is Dines, called Uni Dines Design. Dines yes. Design. Yes. And uh, I have to thank you for, uh, for the wake-up call that, that you have certainly sent to me and to, to my viewers. I think I'm going to go through uh, my community and, and go through the country with uh, a, a new set of eyes. I'm beginning now to see that we don't have to have handicap signs everywhere and that we can have universal design. I want to thank you so much uh, for, for joining us and I want to invite all of you to come back again next week. Uh, remember, we're going to be talking uh, next week about, um, well, <laughs> a remarkable um, product that uh, is being touted as the fountain of youth, but we're just not so sure that it's good for everyone, so we're going to be examining melatonin and DHEA. Till then, I'm Eleanor Shano, and, and remember the good years start right here. Oh, and um, by the way, I, I do want to mention that if you want to hear Patricia Moore, uh, she's going to be delivering a lecture. That's this Friday night, Friday night, March 14th at uh, the Carnegie Music Hall at mm -hmm. 7 o'clock. And uh, the title of your lecture? I'm going to be talking about how design is giving a cure to it all. Okay. Maybe we'll all get together at the Music Hall at 7 o'clock Saturday night. Friday night. Friday night. Good years to start here. Good night. <laughs> Go Nagy Museum. Good night, everyone. WQEX thanks those who have made broadcast of this program possible, our members, and Security Blue, a Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicare HMO from Keystone Health Plan West. And by St. Margaret Memorial Hospital, enriching the lives of seniors and their families. If you're older, you're in capable hands at St. Margaret. For more information, Call 784-4144.